Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG AFTRA Foundation and thank you so much for tuning in to watch another one of our conversations at home videos today. Um, before we kick into today's conversation, I want to continue reminding everyone watching these videos that as a nonprofit, we're continuing to raise money for a COVID-19 emergency assistance fund. This is working to support actors who are currently out of work with all of the film and television productions being closed right now. So please check out the details below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way as this is really helping people with paying basic bills like rent, mortgage, buying groceries, whatever it is that they need to get by day to day at the moment. Um, today, I'm so thrilled to be joined by the wonderful team from HBO Max's new show, Love Life. Uh, we have the wonderful Anna Kendrick, Zoe Chow, Peter Vack, Sasha Compare from the cast, um, and showrunner and creator and EP Sam Boyd, and Bridget Bedard, who's also the co-showrunner and EP on the show. Um, thank you so much for, for jumping in and joining us. And, and Sam, I wanted to start by jumping in and asking you a little bit about creating and showrunning this, since this was your first time taking charge and, and leading on television. You've written for, you'd written previously on things like IFC. I was curious about how like your previous experience in writing for television and independent cinema really lent itself to your understanding, but also kind of what you did ahead of going into filming to really understand what the day-to-day -day of this new job and this new position and this new responsibility was going to look like for you. Yeah, you know, I, I had written the pilot kind of not ever thinking it would actually be a television show. So when it became a television show, I definitely, you know, I had all of the feelings that would come with that of uncharted territory and feeling like, okay, now all of a sudden you're in charge of this huge enterprise. But I think ultimately what was really exciting and, and cool to find was that it was just filmmaking, that it's sort of like whether you are, you know, working on an independent movie or a TV show or a huge movie, it is still just about like, okay, you strip all of the kind of superficial stuff away and it's really just what are the what are the actors doing? How are they connecting with each other? What are we creating in front of the camera and how real can we make it feel? How compelling can we make it? And 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 so I think that was really comforting just knowing that that was, you know, the heart of it, no matter what. Yeah, and then Bridget, you have an amazing experience as, as a showrunner on shows like Rami and the final season of Transparent. And I was curious about the way that you kind of really helped in, in coming in and guiding what the day-to-day -day was going to look like, particularly in pre-production as you were setting up all the logistics and, and how you and Sam really navigated sharing those responsibilities between covering the writer's room and everything that was happening on set at the same time throughout the season. Yeah, I mean, I mean honestly, the, thing, the, the place I think I probably helped the most or was needed the most was just kind of in the initial writing and in structuring the season just because Sam you know as he said he had never done a show obviously and so mapping out a season is is not easy it's pretty daunting when you're looking at 10 episodes and and even just kind of like what's what is story what makes a scene what makes you know this specific season of television different or com more compelling than another season of television when people have so many choices and just kind of helping him navigate that. And the truth is, I just, I don't know how anyone runs a show alone. There's so much to do. So at some point, Sam and I were just like a little, like a, <laughs> a, like a little, you know, married couple on set, even though we're not married, just for the record. Um, yeah. Sam's not really married, sadly. Uh, but, uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but we just kind of divided and conquered and Sam kind of took a lot of the things that I hated to do and I took a lot of the things that he like I wouldn't say hated to do but maybe was too busy to do so he would like take a I call when I would like stay in the room no Sam was great um but yeah so I so I think I think just creatively pacing ourselves and helping him kind of through that was really my biggest contribution at least early on and then on set you know we you know it was one of those shows where we were rewriting literally sadly up until like the literally the last frame of of the season and so we just had to divide and conquer at some point and he would be on set or I would be on set and I would be in the trailer like hunched over a computer while he was on set you know making sure things were going yeah. And then Anna, this was your first time stepping into an executive producer role on a television show and, and you were with Sam and Bridget even through the pitching process when, when you were out there trying to get networks interested in the show and, and walking into all those rooms. I was curious about that as a, as a specific learning experience for you and what you really finessed throughout the process of walking into different rooms and different spaces and just seeing yeah. the different ways in that people were, were responding to the show along the way. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, I had never gone and pitched anything before, so that was definitely a, a, an area where I was like, I'll just 
stay quiet and I'll try to say something funny in every meeting. And um, that was definitely like a learning experience for me. And um, I was, you know, very glad to be doing it with Sam and obviously, you know, under the kind of guidance of Paul Feig. Um, and Sam, you know, just had like this lovely, gorgeous pitch that he had like thought out and, you know, it was just beautiful. And then, you know, I would just try to like make a dumb joke just to be like, you know, it will be beautiful and lovely like that. And also I will be there ruining things. Um, oh. That was my, that was my MO. And, and it's funny because the show now, like I really do think that people in my life would be hard pressed to actually like identify something that was maybe about them. But the version that we went and pitched with made me very nervous. <laughs> Like the the Bible as it was when we were happening to be pitching it, it changed often. But the one that we went and pitched with, I was like, oh no, I'm gonna get so many death threats from so many people I know. <laughs> we need to pull that back. Sorry, I wanted to ask you about your character and, and the way that you play Sarah because she's so existent in the ecosystem of, of Darby's world. We really only see her on screen in those moments. So, so much of, of who she is is the way that their friendship exists on screen. So I was curious about your, your development process with your character and the work that you would do prior to walking on set, but then the way that that discovery continued once you were alongside Anna and saw the way that she was inhabiting her character. Yeah, well, I mean, First of all, I, it, so much of it came from Bridget and, and Sam and just great scripts and scenes and setups. And then walking on set and meeting Anna was so exciting because there was just an immediate chemistry that, you know, sometimes you have to manufacture, but it felt like we didn't really have to do that. And then it was such a collaborative process I mean, because scripts were coming we, you know, the, the day before we were shooting, it was <laughs> thrilling <laughs> and it felt very much like we were generating it together. And it, it was a, a really alive, um, exciting process. And I think that I really give a lot of credit to Sam and Anna who, who were just always like, go, 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 like keep going. And I, I feel like, yeah, Sarah evolved with the season and and got this amazing arc and, um, but that it was a very collaborative experience with Peter too and Sasha. Can I, can I just add on to, pile on to that? Because just from a um, show running writing perspective, we were rewriting so much and sorry everyone in the world for what the pain we put you through. But watching these two women do their scene, you know, do their scenes, perform their scenes, act their scenes. Oh, we were so inspired. We, we actually took that in and added scenes of them together because, because everyone just kept saying more and more and more, like they're so good together. And so, so in that sense, it was, it was really alive. And I feel like, I hope people feel that when they watch the show, it, it just felt like such an alive process and as much work as it was rewriting and adding and rewriting and adding I do think it was for the better and I do think it came out of some of that chemistry of the of the actors for sure. And may, if I may as well to pile on, I do think I had a similar experience where when new directors would come on, uh, they would end up commenting like, oh, you two are so great together. And it was like such a nice surprise. And um, and I definitely found that my personal favorite episode is episode eight because it's the episode with all the women all together all the time. And we got these, un I mean, the embarrassment of riches we have in the cast at all, but especially in that episode where we've got to all be together and add these bonus talents that like graced us with uh, their abilities for that episode. It was really amazing to me to see like what can happen when you let a bunch of women just have interpersonal scenes on screen together um, even though the show is ostensibly about romantic love, um, that I think was a testament to like what can happen when ladies are um, at the at the forefront. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things about the show was that it stepped outside of, of romantic relationships and it talked about family relationships and you know that that very unique kind of intimacy and connectivity between women and and for you, Sam and Bridget, was that something that was really important from from the offset from when you first mapped out what the show was going to be that it was going to transcend to those types of relationships? as well yeah definitely I think you know 
the show's called Love Life, and we obviously always wanted it to satisfy people who come to it wanting a romantic comedy, but we also were never going to limit it to that, I don't think. And, and I definitely feel like that was when we really got interested in it was when we started to realize how we could kind of build these other relationships and how we could dive deep into them the same way we're diving into each romantic relationship, you know, the relationship with their mom or, or the relationship with Sarah and, and, and that that was what made it, you know, I think that's really what cracked it open. And, and I don't know, Bridget, if you have anything to add to that, but I know it was important to us. Yeah, I mean, I think we always thought it would be a part of the show. I don't know that we thought it would be as big of a part of the show as it ended up being. I think that that piece grew and deepened and was just very, very exciting. I mean, even I was, and, I, and just like, just to circle back to um, Anna's comment a second ago with that episode, there's, I, every time I watch the shot where Sarah's dancing and it's like a really long, I don't know if it's a steady cam shot, but it, it moves all the way through the room, all the way back and she does coke and then she moves back. I'm like, oh, that person's doing that. That person's doing that. I, I noticed something different every single time. It's like there was, everyone was so in it and um, just kind of like dialing into the energy and playing off of each other. It was just kind of amazing to watch. And it's like, that's also, that's also Stephanie Lang, the director set that shot up, which allowed for that, but, but it's in the acting depth, you know, and the, and the actors taking the material and just even deepening it and finding like the tiniest moments, like even just an eye look, that's just like every time I watch that, I'm amazed. So um, I think I just totally lost the thread of that question, but yeah, I, I don't know if that was originally like meant to be such a big piece, but it's just something we found in the writing, yeah. Yeah, and for you, Peter, one of the things that you do so well in the way that you construct your character and, and the way that we get to see him is, is again, kind of similarly, we, we see him in the moment of being in this relationship that he's been in for several years, but I was interested in the way that you then thought about reconstructing and evolving him once he steps outside of this relationship because he has such a clear idea of, of what it is that he wants and what his priorities are in stepping outside of that ecosystem that we've seen him exist in up until then. That's a great observation, thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure I was doing it consciously. I just know that uh, in my own experience and love, uh, the, how much of that immediate next relationship move is like, like I think I feel like the moment you're talking about is when you see my character right after we've broken up and I'm with a new woman and I seem like I almost might be like in a new deep partnered relationship but then you realize no it's actually not a thing and i i, I actually think that's like a beautiful moment of writing because without the character of of sarah without zoe's character you are still seeing how that relationship is playing on me and you know in that i'm wanting to recreate it immediately with the second partner although it's not possible so yeah um I'm, I'm not really sure necessarily what the question was. That was just a response. Uh, oh, classic back. Peter. Peter. <laughs> was there a question? <laughs> Bridget trails off and points in. I know what you like. trails off and points <laughs> well, out. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, to, I guess to bring it back to one of the themes, which is praising the writing of the show, because I have my own love for the voice that, that Sam and Bridget created with this. Um, all of the relationships have like an internal coherence and they, they feel like they live in the scenes you see. But I think what makes this show strong and gives it the grounded human feeling that I think people are responding to is that you imagine that they develop and have a life off camera too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you always, that, that, that is a beautiful thing that exists in the writing and then the beautiful actors here make it happen. But sometimes you watch something and you feel, you, you feel the characters become fake. You, you don't believe that they have a life off, for, you know, outside of the scene. And I, I, I never, watching the show, I, I don't feel that way. You know, it's like we're, I'm always believing it. 
Yeah. Well, well, Sasha, one of the things that I love so much about the way that you develop Mallory is, is again, you know, kind of to Peter's point about the life that exists off camera, your character goes on such a journey and becomes so certain of herself. And we find her in this really beautiful, loving, committed relationship and, and making a commitment, but we haven't necessarily seen all the details of that journey. So do, do you, for yourself as part of your process, do a lot of backstory development and, and kind of map out those details for yourself ahead of time? Uh, absolutely. I think that there is actually so much to Mallory off screen. You know, she comes off, to the girls as, as sort of defiant and very assured and not really fledgling. But I think a lot of that and a lot of what attracted me to the story is when Sam and I first met and we spoke, there was something about uh, coming from an, a place of insecurity. Because I think that people who are so sure of themselves are also afraid and they're hiding from something. So it was interesting to have that piece in the back of my mind and, and sort of uh, play with Mallory's honestly aversion to having relationships at first and then becoming the woman who ends up accepting that relationships have you know a purpose and that it can be beautiful and she finds the woman that she believes is is right for her so I did a lot of um you know backstory with figuring out what her parents might be like and what her uh, work might be like and and other things just to keep her real and grounded because we all have friends that we don't listen to uh, <laughs> and I wanted to do justice to that so yeah. yeah no you did it really beautifully and then kind of jumping back to that that episode eight with you Zoe I wanted to ask you a little bit about the way that you portray Sarah and you know substance reliance in the show because I think what's so special about the way that you capture that is it's not the way that we're used to seeing it in movies and television it's not someone who can't function day to day who can't go to their job it's it's a very different type of, of build up and so I was curious about the way that you kind of thought about that and, and mapped that out and approached that so that by the time we get to the moment in episode eight where you know particularly when they're at the club and she just steps away from the group and goes into the bathroom and is kind of having that moment that it's been a journey from episode one reaching up to that point yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was honestly truly terrified of episode eight. <laughs> and um, we had had discussions that there there was going to be this um, crescendo, uh, or I guess a, a real low point. And when I got the script, I, I was so moved by it. and that, But that then that was quickly um, taken over by immense dread <laughs> because I you know I think um substance abuse affects so many people in real life you know it's a it's a very um relevant illness and you know I just felt a lot of responsibility to tell that story uh pristinely and and honestly um even though I, I have not gone through the same um exact trials and tribulations of Sarah. So, but it was really exciting. And um, I, what I could identify with is seeing friends seemingly gracefully like graduate into adulthood and feel like I'm still floundering. I could relate to uh, living in a state of nostalgia and wondering why, you know, things can't just stay the same. Um, and, yeah, by that point, by the time we shot episode eight, it was such a, it was such a safe environment on, on set. It was just family and um, I, I have grew to love these people so much that, um, you know, I, I just, I feel like the emotions were all there. Uh, and are they there right now? Am I gonna cry? <laughs> Uh, you know. but, um, it was, it, what was thrilling about it was I just, you know, I think like the audience, you think Sarah is going to be this one thing when you meet her at the beginning of the season and she becomes so much more than that. And that was also the acting challenge for me. You know, I it started out as, um, sort of comedic relief and, and comedy is very difficult and, and, and uh, demands a lot of skill, but, and it's, it's hard in its own, own way, but then also acting, I think, um, drunk for 
three fourths of the script is really technically hard too. And it was like the first time I've ever done that. So I think, and that was really, I could not have asked for like a better setting to, to take those risks and, or, you know, to have that first draft of like a character who's like really bottoming out. Um, Zoe and I had a funny, if, if I may, Zoe, Zoe and I had a funny experience where when we were shooting the scene where we're sitting side by side in bed, and I'm sort of convincing her to go to rehab and sort of laying the ultimatum of like, you, you have to do this and it's really intimate and we're like, it's, but it was intense, we're crying and stuff. And uh, we were maybe a, a couple setups away from being done. And Zoe turned to me and was like, I'm having so much fun with you. And I was like, I'm having so much fun with you. I am having the best day today. And it was so bizarre to be able to acknowledge that like oh and I hate myself but like as actors well um yeah that, like oh my god I'm having the best time because my scene partner is great and I love this script and like we are really feeling connected to the characters and I and I'm sorry to leave you out Peter but like all of episode eight was just so magical because it was so much later in the season so something else beautiful was happening which was I I got to feel Darby growing up like still you got all those same patterns, but you're learning and to see what Sasha was doing where as, as like a young person, she has all these boundaries. Like that was the, the thing to me about Sasha's character was like this sense of boundaries, like that she has the strongest sense of like who she is, what she wants. And the way that that completely changed by episode eight, that like I'm in the club with with Sasha going, I have to go after her. And she's like, you cannot, you can't help her. You know, it's like the boundaries were her thing and the way that that manifested as her character got more mature was so different. And so like the whole episode had been so much fun. And then, you know, to have this weird moment with Zoe where like, we're both like sobbing in bed and it's just like, this is the greatest day. Who else is loving life? It's so true. It's so true because it was like, it's like the dream right? Because you have incredible writing. You have people who have, are so good at what they do in all facets, crew, creative team, like uh, actors, like everybody is like firing on all cylinders. And then you're looking across to this, your acting partner and you're like, we have a real relationship. We have like moved through this whole thing together and, and not much has to be done. Yes. To, which no, is, you're just kind of like when when Zoe's giving the speech at the dinner table and Sasha and I are kind of like shooting each other these looks and it's like we all we know what is happening between us like we we are not talking about it but we know that as Darby and Mallory it's like when do we step in what do we do like are you gonna say something am I gonna say something and that you know by that point we did have enough of a relationship with each other and with our characters that um you know Sasha and I can have little moments like that and they just like colors that whole episode and the whole season really. Yeah, and you know, because Anna was mentioning that point, Sasha, where, where Mallory has that, that limit and she won't go after her. I think that episode captured, you know, Mallory's friendship so fascinatingly. And that's the moment where we realized just how long they've been friends, the things that they went through at a very young age together and, and how that's really brought them close together, even though there is this growing distance. And, and did you and Zoe kind of like sit down and have a lot of conversations about what you thought that friendship would be and, and these moments? And did you have all those details to work off of in terms of, you, when you were preparing the character at the beginning of the show for episode one? Um, I mean, as Zoe mentioned earlier, we did get the scripts so quick before we shot each episode. So I think that her and I definitely built a relationship off screen in our trailers often. And it made it easy to, you know, come to every episode and just sort of play with each other on the day. And that episode was so beautiful and it was so, gut-wrenching honestly Zoe and I've told you this at the table and after but gut-wrenching to watch her you know just divulge everything and how much our relationship means and I think it's hard for friends when you are sort of growing in different directions you know you have this huge history behind you but at some point you kind of have to let each other live your lives and I thought that episode eight was such a beautiful uh, episode that encapsulated that and captured all of that. And so, you know, I don't know that we had much conversation about our individual characters with each other, but we just sort of 
looked at each other and played off each other and, and it was just such a beautifully written story that it just, it was easy, you know, it was easy. And I think, you know, one thing going off of all of that, like just because of the elliptical nature of the story we were telling, I think it's such a testament to how incredible of a job, you know, all of you guys did. The fact that you, you know, I think like, we're asking about, oh, backstory and stuff like that, but it's like, oh, how about backstory every episode that you're filling in these gaps, you're filling in gaps in time jumps within the seat, within the episodes. And just the fact that, you know, we were trying to do something, you know, which is fairly ambitious by drawing emotional power from omission. And that which, with every character, you know, whether, whether it was Mallory or Sarah or, you know, Peter, what's your character's name? Jesus Christ, Jim, um, yeah. you know, or Darby, that that everybody is is having all of these things happen to them that we're not seeing. And that a lot of the times we're more interested in what we're not seeing than we are in what we're seeing. So for instance, you know, not showing Darby and Bradley break up at the end of episode two, but kind of showing the precursor and the aftermath and and that being more powerful than if we had written that scene. And I think you know, trying to be able to show the way that even though we're kind of anchored in Darby's experience for this season, that these these other people who float in and out of her life and, and are meaningful to her are on their own journeys that feel real. And, and I just can't even imagine how hard that must have been for all you guys to, to, to really sell that and like the sort of mind games that must have ensued from pretending you aged eight years in three months. But no, it uh, felt like I aged eight years in three months, so don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> hey! But you, know, but, you know, but but yeah, just the fact that it's like there's so much happening that we're not seeing, that we don't see Sarah go to rehab, that we don't see, you know, Mallory going to Minnesota and having this teaching job or how she meets Taryn, but that these things are happening and that these lives are being lived and that hopefully that kind of elevates this ensemble above what you would normally see or find in a show like this about like a group of friends where they feel like TV characters, you know. Yeah, and I know that, you know, Anna was mentioning how she was bringing in some of her personal experience to the show a little bit, and Bridget, I know that that was something that you had the opportunity to do as well, and particularly in terms of the storyline with Darby becoming coming a mother, that that a lot a lot of those details and, and nuanced moments, such as even just what it takes to lug a stroller up those subway stairs in New York City, um, and those details coming through, and, and you, you know, I believe that when you went to the Emmys, you even had to take your breast pump with you at that point, and, and so I was curious about kind of what it meant to you to be able to put those experiences into to the show and, and what, what the details were that were really important to you to make sure that they were included in that experience for Darby. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of things in the show that are from a lot of the writers and, and in particular me, I mean, the, the, the throwing of the, of the Tapatio bottle, I did that, you know who you are. And, um, oh. but I think the, yeah, I think the, the biggest, the biggest one was obviously the, the, the baby, having a baby and being a mom and, you know, I'm not a single mom, I am partnered, but I'm sort of a single mom because for a long time, my partner, for the first three years, he lived in New Mexico most of the time. And so, so I was able to really kind of get in there and think what that is to be that exhausted, to be that kind of like your brain just, I mean, I, I don't know if, I know that all, of all the actors, none of you have children, but you, if you do, you will, you, you basically lose your, your mind. And um, I think that it was really, really fun to be able to put things on screen that like I personally haven't seen done a lot, like the leaking breasts and just the like minutia of, of kicking the diaper box down the hall because your hands are so full. That's like one of my favorite moments in the whole show. And, uh, and I think this happened actually, it wasn't even scripted, but, but Anna, when, when, the, when the pacifier rolled into the street, and Darby says the fucking thing. What's it called? I can't even think what it's fucking called. <laughs> and and Augie says pacifier. Um, you know, those are the moments that I really, really wanted to get right and wanted to feel truthful. And um, I think a lot, a lot of women have said, you know, and I'm I'm sort of surprised because I didn't really intend this to happen. But a lot of women have said that have watched the show. Women I don't know and women I know like it is amazing to see her choose to be a mom. And that was unexpected that she's ready at this moment to be a mom in her life. And, and I, and you know, my, sorry, I feel like I'm just rambling now, but I, I, in my life, it was so non-traditional and the way things came together for me were so 
like out of order and painful in a way. And so to be able to put that on screen as a, in a positive way to say, this is okay. You know, most people's lives don't happen that neatly and in the right order. And, and to have people love Darby and kind of root for her in that scenario was really fun and exciting for me. Um, and yes, the Emmys, I did carry my pump and I did have to pump in back behind the caterers. Yes. <laughs> Find the pictures online. I'm like huge boobs leaking. <laughs> no, it's, it's so wonderful the way that it plays out in the show. One of the other aspects that I wanted to ask you about Bridget, Sam and Anna was Darcy's, sorry, Darby's connection to the art world and the way that that's such an important vehicle for how we tell her story. And it's so interesting watching her journey in terms of her career, but also the way that you t looked to different types of art and different mediums of art, whether she's working with antiquities or she's buying a photo from a fellow student or the show that she creates at the end. And, and I was interested in the way that the three of you kind of mapped out those details, figured out what that art was gonna be and how it really would come across as a representation of, of where Darby is in life, but also how she sees herself at each moment. I, I think with a lot of things in the show, we started with archetypes because we wanted to be able to then live inside of them and again, crack them open and, and say, okay, you know, oh, it's a, you know, we've seen, you know, a young woman looking for love and we've seen, you know, a romantic comedy in New York City or we've seen the art world and then really trying to get at what that actually feels like for people who are actually going through that and, and, and that it's not the movie version, but it's hopefully kind of the real life version. And I think the art world stuff was a big part of that. And, and one of the things from the beginning that Bridget and I really kind of keyed in on was this shift from, okay, she sort of starts as a photographer, but us, I think, being able to, in the second episode, have Darby realize that it was, you know, that it was a situation where she wanted to kind of be on the other side of things, and that whether it's the antiquities or the paintings at the end or the, the photograph she buys at the end of the second episode, it was this kind of pivot of like, oh, maybe I don't have this part of me, but I want to show the world beautiful things, and I see beautiful things, and I find them, and I want that to be what I do, you know, for her to realize that so early on, I think felt unexpected to us in a way that, that we really liked and, and drove all of kind of the art stuff from there, that kind of shift to the curatorial aspect of things. Yeah, I think early on in the writer's room, we were talking about like, what does she do? You know, it's like, what's her job and all of that. It's so like something you don't even want to write a scene ever about like what somebody does for a job. So I feel really proud that we made it interesting and um, fun to watch. And I think the pivotal thing in two, episode two, we, we, just, we, fit, we just sort of discovered in the writer's room that it might be interesting to show that somebody discovers they're not that good at something as opposed to like, oh, she like always wanted to be an artist and she just needs to like do it and get there. And you know, it's like, oh, actually maybe I just like kind of like chose this thing and I'm not that good. And it's kind of sad, but kind of freeing. And I think probably more truthful to, to more people than not. So I think that was kind of the, at least the beginning and then the rest, you know, grew from there. And just the little moments you get out of that, like I, the, something that I, like, as you were saying that just flashed into my head, like a late, like a sort of, you know, whatever, like a, a flashing light was the moment, Anna, of like, the look in your eyes when the teacher is like holding up the other person's photo and just that, like how much that says without saying anything, how much is in your face and and just the way that that feels to me is so much more powerful than if we had gone in, in a direction where the teacher was holding up Darby's photo as some great thing. Yeah. One of the things um, for all of you in the cast that I always think is so interesting about coming together as actors is that everyone kind of comes in with their own set of experience and everybody has their own particular working style and the way that works best for them in terms of discovery of their own character, but particularly in terms of the way that you film a scene and, and the way that you try different things and discover all the different ways that you could take each moment. And so I was curious for the four of you kind of what aspects of your working styles really just melded together and, and maybe what some of the differences were as well, but that really complemented each other as you worked on building these relationships between all of these great characters? Um, well, if I may, uh, I there was a point, I think, maybe halfway through where I just turned to these three and I was like, I just can't thank you enough for the talent, professionalism, commitment, you know, just everything was just 
so great. And I, and I, and I recognize that part of that could be that I think we did happen to have very similar working styles um, because, you know, we would have uh, guests come in and I know that every way that you get there, however you get there is completely valid. But there were days when I was like, boy, this is, this scene is, uh, it's a roller coaster for me. <laughs> um, Cause I just, you, your way of working is very different than mine. And that's completely valid. Um, but I would say that I found that it was a similar amount of like staying on book versus improvising and kind of uh, trying to nail down what we wanted the scene to be before we started versus like doing it a couple of times and then going like, let's make this completely different. Um, so I felt so blessed to be around people um, that kind of meshed so well with my working style. But I also don't know if I'm like outing myself as being really selfish because I'm like, they're just like me. Uh, did you kind of find that same experience as well that yeah i mean the part of that that i i relate to all of it um i was so well good writing gives you good ideas for other lines so you always have to start there but i was very pleased that there was a culture of improvisation but it wasn't off the rails i mean i just feel like there was a very nice uh experimental attitude and you don't always get it on television i mean i've done shows and i understand why they need to be this way but their story is you know it's like a procedural crime thing and every everything feels very scientific towards a certain end but our science was a little bit more jazz and that was really cool for this um and yeah also just to be working with people that are so deep I mean, I really, every time I showed up to a scene, I was really um, afterwards very impressed and moved, not just by the work, but by like the person that I was with. And, and that, that means the work's really transcending. Yeah. I like what you said. What a, yeah. what a baby, what an angel. No, sorry, Sasha, I interrupted you. No, no, I just, I like what he said about jazz. It was such a, a fluid experience and I feel like all of our characters did, I mean, you're, you're going through eight years. So, you know, as much as our, our uh, I just think that everyone had such a professional work ethic and such a ability to play off of each other and change on a moment's notice because that's how we work. We, you know, we work pretty fast. And I think it was just such a testament to how open everyone was and, and to, to adapting to changes and to feeding off of each other's energy and you know offering changes you know on the fly and just being ready to work so it was it was such a great experience i think we all just kind of knew what we were doing and went for it yeah and i also want to ask you all a little bit the role that new york plays in the show it doesn't you know it really doesn't feel like oh we just happened to film it in new york you really thought about the details and the way that people live you know people live in living rooms and share apartments, Augie living in a railroad apartment, and even the spaces that you, you take them to. I found myself even nostalgic when they went to Mud Cafe because I haven't been to oh. Manhattan for three months. Um, <laughs> um, and, and just the way that you really kind of mapped that out and used that to enhance the story in terms of the characters, the physical spaces that they're in, and also the specificity of the way that people date in New York. It's, it's very different to the way that it rolls out other places. And, and so I was curious kind of in terms of the character and story, how New York really played a central role to that, and even just the logistical challenges of, of filming in New York City. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I think the whole show for me was about personal nostalgia and, and the ways that we can look back on our own lives and remember moments or remember places or feelings or the way things looked or, you know, felt. And, and, and so a big part of that for me was tapping into my time in New York. I went to NYU for film school and, and you know, the, the beginning of the show, which is 2012, in that sort of pocket of the East Village where they're going to Two Bros Pizza and Veselka and all these places that I went to, you know, drunk all the time in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> it, it ended up being just a shortcut for me to those feelings and what it's like to be that age, what it's like to, you know, I mean, even more specifically than any of like the businesses we use, like one of the most evocative moments in the whole show for me is in the pilot when when Darby is leading Augie up the stairs of her apartment building and looking back at him and just the way that that feels when you're not saying anything to each other and you kind of both know what's about to happen, that giddiness and that awkwardness and, 
and and the charm of that you know always just stirred up feelings in me and 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 so i think it was a way on one level to kind of use the magic of new york but also to use the kind of you know the 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 harsher realities of what it's like to live in the city and and you know the frustrations of it and people living on top of each other and 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 to kind of you know i i remember in prep we would joke that it was sort of like you kind of only ever see like the horse you know, the, like the horse-drawn carriages in Central Park version of New York, or like the, you know, like, oh, I just, you know, stepped in dog shit in my apartment building stairwell version of New York. And we kind of wanted both versions to coexist, that you could kind of, you know, be stuck in the reality of it and kind of longing for the magic the same way these people are when they're, you know, yearning for a, a relationship or a connection. I, I, I just want to add that scene. That is one of my favorite moments in uh, the New Yorkness of that scene where they're walking up the stairs because of the tile. I'm literally like when, when it cuts to Darby's feet and you see the tile, I'm like, how many times did I walk up a, a four, four, four floor walk up and see that tile in my decade of living in New York? Um, and also like just the scene, I just wanted to mention the scene um, is, it ended up being one of my favorite scenes. We added it after the fact because the network had a note that we were trying to address and it's everyone on the subway platform. And they kept pitching, maybe there's a scene in an Uber, maybe there's a scene in an Uber. And it's funny because they can't figure out how to sit in the Uber or fit in the Uber or whatever. And I'm like, no, no like it's a, it's a subway platform scene and we need $100,000 because <laughs> that's the way it is when so you're that really age, you have a dollar fifty or what? I'm so old now. What does it cost to take a train? Three dollars. So, um, so that and, and just the drum, the fucking sorry, the drummers. The it's so hot and the drumming and everyone's just like you can't, you can't. Your train's late and the train's canceled. And I just love the way that 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 um, all the actors just played that. And it's just one of my favorite scenes. You're making me miss the hellscape that is the MTA right now. <laughs> exactly. And then I just wanted to kind of con conclude by asking each of you about what you feel that you really learned about your craft um, from the process of making this show, whether it was, you know, acting, writing, show running, producing, um, maybe starting with you, Peter. I was, had an image of my foot on a gas pedal as we were talking. And <laughs> this is real. <laughs> and there's like this thing of too much accelerating not enough accelerating and yeah i'm always just reaffirm I, I have this feeling reaffirmed that when it's right it's just a very you're it's just enough gas and i felt that on this you know i, I, I it's it's it is difficult to describe but yeah this 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 show gave me more Yeah, another, I felt like we were, we were in the right, we were in the pocket. And so when you're there, it's, it's like, look, I'm at a loss for words because I do find it very hard to describe well. I just felt like this worked so well. When you get, when that happens for you, I, I maybe will be able to answer this question after the next gig. And then I'll be like, I'll tell you what, lo what I learned on love. <laughs> But right now, I just we'll check back in. Nice. Yeah. Can we check back in? Let's schedule a follow up interview, no, please. That, Laura, are you back in six months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The okay. Love Life reunion, reunion Zoom episode. Yeah. <laughs> Great. What about for you, Sasha? Yeah, no. Um, so, when you mentioned what I learned from working on this project, I feel like a lot of it was doing the work and um, creating a lot of backstory for yourself. I think. Um, when there's not much on the page, you know, I did a lot of journaling for my character and a lot of just um, going deep with the work and connecting with my co-stars and talking to, you know, my co-stars and, and the writers about, uh, you know, just being a co-collaborator, I think is so important in a, in a story when you want to make a, an, experience, an experience feel humanized. So I think, um, yeah, do the work. I love it. And what about for you, Anna? Um, I found, uh, the biggest sort of difference to me in terms of my, my, uh, job, uh, on, on this was, and this is sort of piggybacking off of what Zoe is talking about in terms of trust, because I tend to be a very, a, like a technician, uh, when it comes to acting. Um, it's like, I know, uh, 
exactly what my intention is and how to execute that. And um, I think a lot of that might come from uh, working with people where I'm not sure what you're going to do in this scene and I can at least be responsible for myself, you know, and, and that's not a, that's not shade. I'm just saying like, I don't know what you're going to bring and I want to make sure that like I'm delivering what I hope to, at, you know, while trying to bring, bring truth to it, be present, listen to my scene partner, but there's a level of preparation that's like, okay, I know what I hope to accomplish in this scene and I'm going to execute on that. And I had less and less of that instinct um, to the point where really surprising things happened. And I'm not really that kind of actor who like takes it home by accident. That doesn't really happen to me. And it happened to me a couple of times and I was sort of questioning like, is that um, indulgent? You know, am I making this too much about my personal experience? Am I, you know, having a kind of catharsis about whatever's going on in my life? And, you know, is that irresponsible to the project? And I think it was just a true testament to the writing and to the cast that um, it was bringing up so much stuff for me that wasn't even necessarily very specific to that exact scene. It wasn't like, oh, I've had this exact experience, but, you know, just allowing myself to um, kind of let the wheels fall off, um, you know, and, you know, there were, there was a moment where I turned to Hope Davis and was like, I am so sorry. That is not, to be honest, that is not how I was expecting this scene to go. Um, and I just decided to kind of let it rather than kind of go, well, no, this is how I imagined it when I read it. This is how I imagined I would do it. This is how I did it in rehearsal. Um, and having that kind of freedom was uh, really surprising professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. What about for can you? I just, yeah. Can I just, sorry, Mark, can I just shout out one of my favorite moments in the whole season, which is Anna's sneeze in the pilot. Hey! <laughs> and Augie's reaction, Jin's reaction. It, I mean, the, that to me, I will watch forever. And it was one of us every time would be like, don't cut the sneeze, don't cut the sneeze. Don't cut the sneeze. <laughs> I just remember in that moment. You don't have to work with somebody like Jin, who just continue, who just says bless you and continues. <laughs> to and again, I'm such a technician, and I'm used to working with kind of other technicians who would go, okay, we'll just take it from two lines back. Okay, ready. And it was like it, to it was just such a there was such a different vibe on this set. It was so beautiful. <laughs> Love it. What about for you, Bridget? Oh my God, so many things are just coming up for me. So I probably will ramble here, but. Um, I, it, it's funny that Anna's saying like you, that you're saying that about being a technician um, because I feel like that's the way I am about about the writer's room and writing and I'm I'm always like I know how to get this done I know how to make a good show I know how to write this I know how to write a good scene and I just kind of like I'm just like this little like mule going through and which is why no one ever saw me on set um, but like even though I'm I do, I do feel like, yes, I'm the, like, was the kind of, like, older, like, wiser showrunner that I'm sure I taught Sam so much, but um, I also, like, I learned from Sam, Sam, I learned so much from you because Sam, I'm like, oh, you have to talk to people, too, okay, like, I just, I walk, I literally, I know, sounds obvious, but, like, I just, like, never kind of, like, managed my relationships with people on other shows. I just kind of, like, thought, I'll just write the stuff, and then they'll do it, because they're good, and we'll just, you know, but Sam put a lot of energy into, um, sorry, this is, like, not meant to, like, tell you how great you are, Sam, but I'm, but this is truly what I learned on the show. I would, he would be like, oh, we should call so-and-so, we should call um Sasha and talk about the scene we should call so and so we should have coffee with so and so we should and I'm like we don't have time and then and that that it was a little bit of the divide and conquer and he would do that and I just I do see the results I do see the results of that because I, I in addition to this you know you guys are all so amazing and when I watch scenes I'm like oh my god fifth time I've seen this and I just noticed that Sasha's doing making this little look or you know, everyone was like carrying their own and everyone was so professional. I know they're supposed to be, but like a lot of sets of people aren't. Um, but, but somehow like I think, and I credit Sam with a lot of this and I credit you guys with a lot of this, there just was this kind of glue that was happening that was deeper than just, you know, the mechanics of making a show. Mm -hmm. And so I guess for me, what I learned and it's so outside of my personality, cause I really like, I like don't ever want to talk to anyone or have a phone call or do anything like that is to just, 
force that person, my per, part of my personality out so that there can be that human element that gives room for something else. Did that make sense? That's my, that's what I learned. Hey, that was lovely. Thank you for sharing um, that. And then, and then finally, how about for you, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I think just on the heels of all of this, like, and, and almost even thinking back to your first question, Mara, like <clears throat> before I made this show with these lovely people, I had made like a number of short films and I had directed one independent feature. And in every one of those situations, everything in those movies and the, you know, in those shorts, like was me for better or worse. Those were my choices. And, you know, I made okay ones and, you know, ones I wish I hadn't or whatever. But at the end of the day, being able to kick it up a notch here and, and all of a sudden be making something that's so much bigger than me and has all of these other voices that I was so excited to bring into the fold to kick it all up a notch. And, and, and so that, you know, we could, you know, so that each of these actors could function like the department head of their character or something and, and that we could really figure it all out together. You know, that was what was so exciting for me just because I do think you know, when you, when, you know, A, part of it is just, as Bridget said, there's so much to do, you have to divide and conquer. And I think a big part of that is just, you have to trust people and you have to, you have to, you know, bring the right people together who understand the thing that you're making so that we can all run with it. And, 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 and I think a lot of that comes from, you know, even with like my writing, when I write something, I'm always, eager to bring other people into it and and to push it past what I've started with that it really is this kind of blueprint not that I want to throw out but it's sort of the same way I think Anna's talking about you know bringing her abilities as a technician to something and then loosening up and giving into it you know each of us have to kind of do that work first to then be able to kind of find the, the magic thing or the special thing that you can't get to unless you throw you know not throw the work out the window but kind of Kind of loosen up a little bit in that way and 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 it's getting to, you know, what'd you say i'm sorry it's not, oh, it's inappropriate. i was just calling it back to to peter vack's jazz right yeah and yeah. Energy. i'm sorry Sam, I that was not, really I beautiful I personally, and I, like personally, I personally never make the jazz analogy but i'm happy peter did and i think you know it's just it's just it was it was amazing to to sort of you know be able to see what all of these incredible talented people brought to the table and, and how much better it was than it ever would have been if I had had to, you know, make all those decisions myself. And I learned how to write from Bridget. <laughs> you all did such a fantastic job in, in pulling this together and, and telling these stories. So thank you so much for, for the show and for taking time to talk about it today. Really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Thank you, Mara.